is a Gargan deck. Welcome back. So, we're onward and upward. So, in the last video, if you're following along here, we talked about the foundation system. I broke the ice on it, gave you basically the basic concept. It's a double wall assembly laying on its back, um, virtually. So, we're going to dive into that detail. For those of you that are new to this video series, I suggest go back, catch up on those uh, previous videos, but this is a passive house that, um, let's see here, yeah, passive house that I designed back in 2009. It went under construction in 2010 and it got certified in 2011. Um, so, about, I think it's 18, 1900 square feet, but go look in the previous videos. We outline all the specs on the house. Uh, I did a whole video just on the numbers for you. So hopefully you enjoyed that. But uh, today we're going to concentrate on that floor detail in there. Now notice you have grade here and notice the floor is up here. And this is a slab above grade house. Right. Some people might say on grade, but it really wasn't on grade. We formed foundation walls, backfilled it, elevated the ground a little. Believe it or not, um, I think it's about 70 feet here, and you are at the water. And you can put a kayak there in, and if you leave that shore and head east, then at some point you'd end up in England. Yeah, so we're right on the big water um, on the ocean there. So <clears throat> it's actually a little alcove that leads to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, this is in climate zone five. It's up here in New England. It's down on the on the Cape Cod. Uh, so, anyways, let's dive into those details. So. Last time we met, we talked about it. I'm not going to go over this because we did a whole video on this, but basically that foundation plan, remember, we talked about multiple bearing lines, the foundation plan here, floor joists are spanning here in that direction. We blew this up, right, this detail here to get an understanding of how that framing is going, where we have our foundation wall here, we poured our slab. So our slab, remember, is outside the building, right? We push that outside. Now, interesting thought there, when we started out on this project, one of the drivers that led to that detail was, um, we had our passive house consultant, remember, year 2009, he just got his Passive House Consultant Certification. Um, when I met with the client here and they asked me if I know what a Passive House is, I uh, discreetly said, oh yeah, sure, excuse myself, went into the uh, powder room and I was Googling what a Passive House was, came out and said, yeah, uh, what were we, talking? we were talking about Passive House. It has an energy metric and airtightness associated with it. Um, at the time, in 2009, I think there were maybe two or three um, houses out in um, Champaign-Urbana that were under construction and on the verge of being the first passive houses um, in the country. So when this one got built, I mean, we were probably one of five in the country. So bringing that certification um, to the U.S. and certifying it, um, it, uh, you know, Put us on that list but every time when i talked with this consultant and his uh let's say construction understanding was moderate and that's one of the challenges here is that you know when you have a project like this you have an architect right you have a builder you have the passive house regs which they have people that want to review this. And then we have our passive house consultant. And you know damn well what I'm about to say. And of course we have the owner, right? But every one of these five has an opinion, 
right? So you understand what I'm saying when you say, uh, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen or, um, you know, whatever, whatever cliches you have. But the reality was, is that we had it, uh, we had this. Um, I was probably the most experienced in understanding the Passive House. I mean, apart, apart from, say, the, the people at Passive House that brought it here. But the builder had never done anything beyond Energy Star. Right, so he was definitely, uh, you know, going into uh, outer space on this one, and pretty much everything was new. The passive house consultant was new to this. He actually was an electrical engineer um, before doing this project, so he had a vague understanding of construction and what he learned at the passive house class. So he would come to me and say, hey, we need to do this, we need to do this. Now, understand also, Passive House came from Europe. In Europe, they build with a masonry base, um, usually, and then insulate on the outside. In America, we build with a wood base frame. And then we tend to, yes, we can insulate on the outside, but we tend to insulate within. So the technology that we have or we're using here is slightly different than the technology in Europe and so Passive House is trying to merge that with a consultant that was moderately um, had an understanding of what we were doing but anyways every time I caught up with him he would tell me hey we we have two inches out there we got to add another two and then a couple weeks later we would progress we'd move on and say you know I was running the numbers we really should have you know six inches out there um, and okay, and then all of a sudden it's like, hey, we should have eight inches. And I said, no. I put my foot down and I said, we can't. And he's like, what do you mean you can't? And I said, if I start going to a builder and telling them we want to attach eight inches, mechanically fasten it to a foundation wall, you know, we're, we're going to get some crazy eyes. There, there's got to be a better way. And so I looked at the double wall assembly at the top of the building that we were doing and I basically rotated it 90 degrees and said what if we do that and he said do what and I said why don't we just take our double wall assembly and lay it on its side and he said you can do that and I said sure on that double wall assembly we have insulating sheathing in this case right and then we have a cavity wall that if I rotated this this could very much be a stud frame just as easy as it is a floor frame, right? By rotating this 90 degrees and having it so that you have the stud, the space, and then you have some insulation here. But that is no different than this. It's just the orientation is rotated. And you know what I'm going to say if you've seen any of my previous videos? Mother Nature doesn't really give a damn, right? Her rules are her rules. Heat moves from hot to cold. Moisture moves from high to low. It doesn't matter whether it's a vertical surface, horizontal surface, slope surface, 33.568 degrees. doesn't matter to Mother Nature. Her rules are her rules. Um, so, let's dive into that detail. Now that you kind of have a brief understanding of where it came from and how we develop it. So, <clears throat> up here you can see here's that foundation wall that we talked about let's make that a little beefier here all right and then of course we poured the slab and the slab did not need to be insulated in any way because we're putting our insulation on top right so we have our one layer there of two inch xps and we have one layer there of 2 inch XPS. So this is R5 per inch. So this total is R10. Right. <clears throat> and then of course we have our let's grab a black pen here. We have our 2 by 10 here. And then this is our pony wall that we talked about, right? And that pony wall is nothing more than to carry that 2 by 8 16 inch on center frame. 
floor frame that's obviously spanning in that direction given the bearing point. So what that does is that <coughs> freed up all of this space for insulation. Um, I don't have the dimension on there, but if that's 8, that's 16, it's probably is on the order of about 18 inches, so that's 40, 72. It's probably about R68, let's just say, in cellulose plus the R10. So we have an R78 um, floor frame there. And you can see a couple um, points here that I want to point out. Um, the bearing wall runs down the outside here, sits on the double plate here. That's the one that's carrying the floor, second floor, it's carrying the roof. This is a non-load bearing floor, right? It's basically carrying the drywall on the inside. But understand these dimensions, right? So we have two by six, two by four, and then we have seven inches in there. So that's nine. So that's a 16 inch wall overall. And again, this is Passive House, and this is Passive House in its infancy. That was before they climate-tuned their calculations across, you know, the U.S. Remember, in Europe, this stuff's coming out of Germany. There was, what, I don't know, maybe one, maybe two climate zones in Germany. In the U.S., we have eight. So it's a lot different if you're building a Passive House, say, in Alaska or International Falls, Minnesota, versus, say, uh, Mobile, Alabama, or San Diego, or if you go to a drier climate like Phoenix, or Denver, right? Cold, dry. Um, so there's a lot of uh, different things happening here. Um, so the, the regulations and the calculations were much higher. If we had to build this house today, 14 years later, I'm guessing we would be somewhere at about 70% of the R value levels um, that we put in this house um, just due to that climate tuning. Um, but anyways, having that floor frame on the inside and then having the exterior bearing wall, what that means is the only piece that really touches is that one piece of Advantec that came out here and basically bridges this distance and goes out to a ledger that's simply spiked into those studs. Um, and that really, it's doing two things. It's providing a diaphragm across the house that ties the whole floor system into this exterior wall, you know, nice and, uh, nice and tight. But it also um, becomes a fire blocking for that cavity. And you can see we did fire blocking here with a wool bat. You know, basically rock wool. Um, and, you know, when you get into these thicker walls, back then we were a little bit afraid of, you know, moisture is getting to the inside. I see a, a lot of people, they design these double wall assemblies. And the problem with their thinking is they say, go, they'll go through and fill them up, say, with cellulose. Well, the difference between a 16 inch wall and say a five and a half inch two by six wall, the five and a half inch by um, two by six wall, that has a lot of energy making it to that first condensing surface. All right, so this is the hardline building science of it, right? You only have so much energy um, that, or you have a lot of energy that can make it to that face and keep it relatively warm. I don't know exactly the numbers, but let's just say we're at 70 degrees inside and it's 30 degrees outside, right? A day like today. Well, that means that that inside face here losing some heat, let's just say it might be I don't know, 38 degrees, All right? Now, let's go to the 16-inch wall. If I do the same thing here, I have a lot of energy 
coming into that wall, but it dissipates because of the level of insulation I have. So by the time I get here, I have very little energy, right? You can see here, if we graphed it like that, as opposed to this one like that. So this one, we have a whole lot of energy hitting it. This one, we have a, a whole lot going into the wall because it's 70 there. But by the time it gets here and it's 30 degrees outside, this might be 31 degrees. I'm guessing it might even be 30 degrees. So you don't have a lot of, um, what you call it, energy making it through a 16-inch cellulose wall. So what we did was... We came in and we splashed this with two inches of closed cell. Um, now, we all have different views on spray foam insulation. And if we were to do this wall again, we would probably do it a different way. Um, but, um, you know, what the building science behind this is, that first condensing surface now moves... From here, it moves inboard to here. But the important thing is that two inches of closed cell gets us somewhere around, say, R13 to 14. So now, if we came in and we said it's 70 inside and 30 outside, well, inside of that, now that might be something like 45 degrees inside. So it's significantly warmer. Why does the warmer matter? Well, the warmer means that any vapor migration through this wall system, right here, there's a high chance, and here there's a very high chance of getting condensation. Where here, you might have a very small chance because I've elevated the temperature of that first condensing surface. And because this is impermeable, that vapor stops at that first condensing surface. So that's what provides the success of that wall system. Now, one of the uh, things about this detail I liked, notice here, the rigid insulation intentionally stopped There and we have the two by mud sill there and the, the wall plate there. There is a space here, right? That space was intentional. Right? And I'm going to give you a second or two to think about it. Why would we leave a space there, right? What's my favorite word um, when it comes to building science? Continuity. Continuity is the key. Say it with me. Even at home, say it with your kids every morning. All right. Continuity is the key. So if I leave that little gap there and I stop the insulation short, when they come and they shoot the spray foam, it comes down the wall, goes over here, and I give them that little cavern to fill. And that little cavern means that, switch gears here, it means that my rigid insulation is now connected to that insulation. And I've provided that level of continuity through that system. Right? So, anyways, that's that floor detail. Now, one of the things to notice about this um, detail here is you're going to say, hey, Steve, that's a really cool detail, but, you know, a closer inspection on this, all you have here is really the information for the framer, right? Um, there's no information there like for the cider. What kind of siding did you put on this? What kind of building paper is on this house? Or what is the, you know, <clears throat> rain screen system? None of that information is here. Well, again, remember early on when I gave you the list, the builder had never done anything beyond Energy Star, which means his framers probably haven't done anything beyond Energy Star. So one of the things that was architecturally um, derived from doing this project was I did what I call a set of twins. So this is exactly the same detail that we just marked up, 
But looky here. This one has the water table. This one has the screen mesh. This one has the wood furring rain screen called out. This one has the cap to our water table. This has the lap siding drawn on it, right? It has all that. Now, it still has all the information from the previous detail, and it still has all of the sealants, the rigid insulation, the 2x10, but none of that is called out. The finished stuff is called out there, and all of the finished stuff there. So basically, there are two details. They're exactly the same. Detail one here takes you from nothing to the completion of the framer's scope of work. And then detail two is the detail that the cider and everybody after the framer that comes aboard, they use that detail. What it does is it just takes out some of the muddy water and provides a little bit of clarity to the uh, detail for the framer because he doesn't have to wade through. All of the information that's on that first detail, all of it is required knowledge for the framer. So splitting that up as the architect and having what I call, you know, I call them twins. I mean, there's no magic in that word, but basically they're the same. They're identical twins. They just have slight variations. So let's take a uh, quick look. Um, this is just, you know, nice favored detail of mine. You can see there's the foundation wall system. Um, there is our sill sealer there, our anchor bolt there. But look at all that black, goopy stuff, right? One of the things about this house was we, and I say we as the passive house consultant, myself as the architect, and more importantly, the builder, we all committed to point six zero ACH at 50 Pascals. And that's the air tightness, right? Because we promised the homeowner contractually that we were going to deliver a passive house, a certified passive house. And so we had to figure out ways to develop air sealing practices. So here you can see the mud seal going down. This is Tremco. It's their acoustical sealant, better known by many builders as the Black Death, because once it gets on you, it gets on everything. Now, one of the things you see in here, we have a self-adhered membrane here that we put on the slab and then we attached it. That was the consultant and I had a um, uh, very nice discussion about whether or not the concrete slab could be considered an air barrier. I thought it could. He thought, no way. And this is that whole, like, him not having as much construction knowledge. Um, plus, he didn't like it when I said, okay, we'll kneel down and try and blow through it. He didn't appreciate that comment. Um, but the reality is, if we were doing this detail again, I would just seal that to the concrete. We wouldn't, I don't think we, I didn't think we really needed it back then, and I certainly don't think we need it now. But the other thing to understand is, we had five cooks in the kitchen. And so, if you don't believe in something, you know, you have to be somewhat cordial in your discussions and arguments. You can't just always ask for your way. So this was an easy one to give in. The builder didn't mind, added a few bucks to the project. So we did it. Um, it's buried in the house there. Um, and I'm sure it contributed maybe a little, but I don't think we really needed it. Um, here's a good shot of that floor frame you can see there and you can see there's the bearing wall but more importantly you can see this is that last joist here and then we have our ledger here that goes around so there's that space where we thermally break the inside of the house here with the outside there um, but uh, and then here's a really cool shot. This is just while we were putting the insulation in. You can see we have uh, the floor joists are here. A little hard 
to see there and there's one there but the important thing is look at the insulation is billowing up and we did that intentionally because we were screwing down and nailing down the uh, Advantech here <coughs> we want to make sure we we're getting a really good density so we kind of overfilled <coughs> that uh, floor detail in an effort to when we screwed down the Advantech there that um, we were getting a really good dense packed system in there so anyways there you have it folks i'm steve basic architect this is my vibe board i love this thing um, just the ability to switch between different pages and uh, communicate via photo um, all of that so really cool um, if you want to find out more about me, certainly you can go to the Build Show. I'm one of the contributors there. Um, we have, I don't know, I probably have at this point about 230 videos maybe there of all different aspects of what we've been doing for the last couple of years. Um, and I'm also a co-host on the Unbuilder podcast where you can catch up with me, Jake and Peter. Um, and that is now under the umbrella you can find it under the uh, build show network there it's in their catalog of uh, goodies and you know the cool thing about the build show it's kind of like youtube it's all free all right and if you're still looking for more you can find me at steve basic architect on instagram i'm posting a couple posts a day i put a bunch of comments in there when i feel it's appropriate. You can find me on LinkedIn at Stephen Basic. You can find me at Facebook at Steve Basic Architect, TikTok. And of course, you found me here on YouTube. You know I'm going to tell you. Please go hit that subscribe button. Don't hit it. Smash it. Smash that subscribe button. Tell all of your friends. And uh, until we meet again, long live our building.